All right, guys, so we've talked about what biology is and what the characteristics of living things are, but today we're going to talk about how biologists actually study living things and learn new things about them. All right, so I can watch living things all day. In fact, I can watch myself. I can pick up a peach or a banana, and those are living things, and I could say, mm, it's yummy. I can look at my dog and say, aw, he's cute, and I am making observations about living things, but these aren't really facts, right? They might be facts to me. I like peaches and I think my dog is cute, but they are subjective claims, meaning it's subject to whoever is saying it, right? You could hate peaches and you could think my dog was ugly. I would disagree with you, but you could have that opinion, right? Scientists try to come to objective conclusions about the world. Things that are not so debatable as my dog is cute or peaches taste good. Okay, so objective conclusions are not related to personal feelings or opinions, and they're based on data. They're based on repeatable patterns and measurements and observations that can be observed over and over again consistently. Counting the oranges on this plate is objective. Saying, mm, I love cake, subjective. So in order to understand more about the world, scientists collect careful observations and conduct experiments using what we call the scientific method. All right? And the scientific method is a process that scientists use when trying to answer questions about the world. And by using the scientific method, they're able to collect and repeatedly collect numbers and measurements and observations that allow them to make those objective conclusions, meaning it's not just an opinion, it's based on this repeated observation. So you've probably heard about this in all of your science classes up until this point. Usually we cover it in the first week of class. So this is the process by which scientists ask a question, they think up an answer to that question, a hypothesis, but then they test out an experiment to see if their hypothesis is correct. And in an experiment, they collect data, they analyze it, and they do a conclusion. So let's go over those steps real quick. All right, the first step is a question. And a good scientific question identifies a relationship between two variables that a scientist wants to study. So what does that mean? Well, for example, a scientist might want to study what factors might help plants grow. All right, so if they wanted to study how does light intensity, the amount of light a plant gets, affect its growth, that would be two different variables, the light intensity and the plant growth, and the relationship between the two. By changing one variable, what we call the independent variable, you can collect data on how another variable the dependent variable responds to that change. So with the light affecting plant growth, light is independent because it's not like plants growing a lot will cause there to be more light. Okay, the light is the one that we're gonna change, the amount of light, and you collect data on how the other variable, the dependent variable, plant growth, would respond to that change. Okay, so one more time, light would be independent, plant growth would be dependent because it depends on light to grow. So a hypothesis is the second step. Once you have your question with your two variables, you can start to propose an answer to that question. So I might think if light intensity is strong or high, then the plants will grow a lot. And I might base that on my personal experience of having house plants that don't do well with low light or having a garden that grows better in the areas that have lots of sun. All right, the third step is to actually design an experiment. So yeah, just because I have experience of plants growing better in light doesn't necessarily mean that all plants grow well in good light. So it might depend on the plant that I'm using. And too much light might be bad. So an experiment is really important to see whether your hypothesis is right. Okay, it's a controlled set of procedures to collect data to answer the question. 
So in an experiment, you have an independent variable, the factor that you change, and a dependent variable, the, fa um, the data you collect that might change depending on the independent variable. So I'm going to move my face down so that you can see that. If you hear my dog in the background, I apologize. Shush. No. All right. So the independent variable is the factor that you change. And that would be like light, right? We're going to change the amount of light that the plants get. And the dependent variable is the data you collect, which would be the plant growth, which might change depending on how much light the plant gets. In an experiment, you also want constants, which are factors that don't change. They're not the variables that you're studying. Remember, the question has two variables, light and plant growth in this experiment. So the constants would be not light and not plant growth, but other things that might affect the plant's growth. So you wouldn't want to give some plants more water than the other plants, because then you might actually be testing how much water differences affect plant growth. And you wouldn't want to change the amount of soil that you give to different plants because then you might be testing soil instead of light. You want to keep things constant. The control group is going to be the test group where the independent variable should not affect the results. If you've ever heard of like a test of drugs and there being a placebo where some people just take a sugar pill that doesn't have any effect, that's a control group. All right, so in the experiment, you might be collecting two different types of data. Quantitative data is when you use numbers. So look, there's an N in the word quantitative. That N stands for numbers, okay? So any measurements or quantities of things. For the plant growth, you might be measuring how many centimeters they grew. Quantitative data is usually the data scientists are looking to collect because it's more objective. You can't really argue with numbers all that much. Now, qualitative data, though, is also pretty valid. Sometimes you can't, you can't give a color or a number necessarily, right? So qualitative data is qualities, like the color of things and the sounds and the smells and the textures. All right, after you've collected all your data, you analyze the data, okay? And this is where scientists put their data that they collected into tables and charts and graphs so that they can see the trends or the patterns to see if there was actually any relationship between those two things they're studying, right? So does light intensity actually affect plant growth? Maybe a graph would help us figure that out. All right, my dog is going crazy in the other room, so I apologize if his whines are messing with the audio, okay? But step five, okay, the last step of the scientific method is to form a conclusion. So based on analyzing that data, based on your graph, does the hypothesis hold, right? Was the hypothesis true? Does light intensity affect plant growth? And if so, how? Right, so this is usually a good solid paragraph of explanation that tells anybody else who's reading the scientific paper, what was the conclusion? What, what did they find out, if they found out anything? All right, guys, so tomorrow we're gonna be using seeds to explore the scientific method. And I'm going to explain this lab during a Zoom meeting tomorrow, so make sure you're checking your email and remind for that Zoom link. Okay, but basically we're going to look at the process of germination, which is when a seed sprouts. So here are some seeds sprouting in a bag with a plastic, with a paper towel in it, and that is what we're going to do in our lab at home, but in the Zoom meeting I'll walk you through it. Okay, so for that Zoom meeting, what I want you to get is 20 different seeds. And this could be from a lot of different things. So some of you might be like, I don't have any seeds. Well, maybe if you have an apple lying around or some tomatoes or a cucumber or a squash or a pepper, seeds from any type of vegetable will probably work. Um, beans, if you have any dried beans, are perfect. You can get seeds from outside if you see any dried like flowers and seed heads. So collect some seeds. And if you can't collect them, there are going to be some available for pickup at the school. 
Okay, so in addition to seeds, you're gonna need two paper towels. If you don't have paper towels, maybe you have some toilet paper at home that you could use or a washcloth that you could use as well. Okay, so paper towels, napkins, toilet paper, or washcloth. You're gonna need two bags. Ziploc bags are ideal because they will seal. But if you don't have Ziploc bags, maybe some plastic bags are available. Maybe you've got some grocery or produce. Maybe you have like some food item that has like a sealable thing at the top that you could use that bag for. Okay, so just make sure that you have two bags of the same type, 20 different seeds, and some paper towels. If you do not have any of those, they are available at the school. At the bus lobby entrance, there is a sign that says seeds. All right, so have the materials ready for the Zoom tomorrow, and I will see you then. All right, bye guys.